You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 83, Interviews Done Right with Amy Morgan. This week, Amy Morgan from Spear Practice Solutions joins us to talk about how to interview for your next job. If you're an associate, how do you pair up with the right owner? Do you need to take disc analysis or some Myers-Briggs test? Or how about if you're an owner, how do you hire the next assistant or office manager? And then do clinical skills outweigh leadership skills? Or do we need to be taking leadership classes as dentist owners? We find out this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. Do you want to be able to understand, place, restore, and implement dental implants into your practice? Well, we've got the course for you, Restorative Driven Implants, taught by the Dental Guys. Restorative Driven Implants is coming to Nashville in 2019. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com now to sign up. That's RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, this is a new year and a lot of stuff happening this year. A lot of things that we are interested in. Um, I know that last year was, um, man, it was a fast year. I mean, like, I know we say that stuff and like, gosh, time does fly. And um, I'm excited about some things that you and I are doing Mm -hmm. uh, behind the scenes that we can't really talk about. Yeah. Um, But we're always, you know, the dental guys started out. As John and Wes behind the scenes about, hey, have you seen some research on this? Have you right. tried any of this yet? What have you seen at CE? Have you heard anything? That's how we started this conversation. Yeah. yeah. And recently, um, you know, I was on a forum and I saw you some. You know about those forums, man. You got to watch out. <laughs> no, <laughs> we say stay off of there. Don't I know, we? I know. <laughs> I was so what did you forum. see on there, man? What did you see it was on like, there? It was cool. It was cool yeah. stuff, man. I'm seeing you see cool stuff. You see yeah, cool stuff because it's sure. super flashy stuff that catches the eye. Sexy. And uh <laughs> right. So this new product, and I don't want to really it's not new. No. Um, is PEC. Poly ether ketone ketone, right? Poly Ether ketone ketone P E K K. Mm-hmm. Now the brand name of this product is called Pecton. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now the interesting thing is that uh, there's a company, and that that brand name Pecton is is actually owned by uh, Sindres Metal uh, MedTech, uh, some you know Swiss company uh, that owns the rights to Pecton, mm-hmm. and there's a couple things you can do with Pecton is you can mill it for dental applications and you can also press it. So you can do an investment just like you would with like gold or, and you have like a Pecton puck that mm-hmm. you heat that, that actually sets above this molten like investment. And then you press the Pecton into, and then basically divest it and clean it and all this kind of thing. So yeah. what I've recently seen, John, is just some cool applications for this new product. Now, I, I just did a quick little search on um, PubMed the other day, yeah. and I searched PEC and then space dental, and about 15 to 17 articles came up, some unrelated to prosthetics some just looked at hey it's biocompatibility does it mm-hmm. stain does it stink <clears throat> is it bacterial static does things grow on it 
Um, some things were dental related from a standpoint of like, can we make crowns out of this? Uh, there was a few proof of concept full arch prosthetics like implant. And that's actually what caught my eye is that these implant prosthetics that are being milled mm-hmm. um, and then uh, pink placed, uh, you know, you know, pink is being stacked onto this with composite resin and then maybe even crowns, um, you know, made out of this material too. So, right, John, I, I think that it's an interesting thing. Uh, you should know that we are looking into this material, but there's no long-term data. Now, when I say long-term, I'd like to see some some stuff. You know, I'd like to see right. some stuff that's been tried for a, for a yeah, while. Yeah, because all there all there is right now that we're aware of, and I think we're I feel pretty confident saying we're aware of everything as far as this material because we've really I, looked I, at it. I mean, remember we talked to Darren Deister last year about this, and he's interested in it too, and he kind of said, "Hey, there's really nothing like long-term," and We've looked and looked, and really all there is, I, I believe there's only one published case report. I mean, one published case yeah. report. I mean, so what this tells us is there may you be some of this that. being done, but it's it's not it's not being being published, really. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. not if it is being done, it's not being published. And so of course that makes us a little nervous because why is it not being published? Is it not being published because just haven't gotten to it. It's too new. Is it not being published because the data is being put together and nobody's just decided to publish it yet? Or is there, or is there a problem with this material? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, all we know is that there's been some, there has been some research done on the strength of the material. Definitely. Mm-hmm. You know, there are some studies that are showing that it uh, has some good mechanical properties. You know, that's mm-hmm. true. Uh, but there have been so many uh, materials that have been released that have good mechanical properties. Not all of them become good dental materials. But the interesting thing is, is here we got dental labs, Wes. I know. That are advertising this restoration of either pecton monolithic or pecton with crowns milled to fit onto like essentially pecton preps with composite layered. Mm-hmm. And you know, Wes, have you seen the prices? For these yeah. things, I mean, they're charging seven thousand bucks. Some of them for this now. Some of them are less. Yeah, they're pretty uh, aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, they're beautiful. Don't get me wrong. So they're charging a lot of money, and they're doing it as like we had. We saw one person on this forum say it's the top of the top, as far as full arch implant restorations, and it's like, well, based upon what you know, okay, based me, upon let, what let, you know, the very first zirconia hybrid that I did. I remember um, seeing UNC Chapel Hill, and we were talking to, um, help me out here, John. Lyndon Cooper. Uh, yeah, Lyndon Cooper, sorry. And I'm sitting, you know, in a gla- class, probably about 20 people, and he's, like, showing us zirconia for the very first time. And I remember going up to him, and I'm like, okay. I was like, how, how, how much have you guys been using? He's like, we're using it, like, all the time. He's like, there are certain things you need to do, like things we've figured out. Like he's figuring it out in a university setting. And then I was like, well, who else has been using it? He's like, well, they've been using it in Europe for like 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, hmm, okay, that's interesting. So that being said, you know, are we, again, you know, jumping the gun here, you know, and calling a material like it's amazing before we even know if it works or not? Right, we have no idea. I think, you know, we've hit on this a little bit before. We've got to be very careful, but, you know, to make sure that we're not testing products on our patients without letting them know, hey, this is not, you know, been tested long term. It's proof of concept right. stuff. Well, this know? this whole thing can't, you know, you think about what well, this is kind of fresh on the show we did just a little while back where we talked about Seltra. Right. And it just, it really, to me, so. Same kind of deal, man. I don't know for sure what. <clears throat> dense ply knew and didn't know. I don't know for sure how much basic research they did, but here is the largest dental company in the world now mm-hmm. who releases a product and when given feedback about the product, sounds like maybe they ignored it and now they're kind of getting called out for failures and that material has been used daily by a lot of people. Now, maybe maybe it's not as bad as we think, but 
you know, it definitely should make you skeptical about new materials that at least we need to see some data. It doesn't mean that uh, Seltra is bad. Maybe it's great. We just need to see data. We just need to see data published long term, especially now. You know what, Wes? Seltra, not really a big deal. You know, I mean, if you did 25 Seltra restorations because you wanted to try it and five of them failed. Now, that's bad and that's frustrating. Yeah. And you're going to have to eat some of that. But you know what? That's a relatively easy thing to fix. But you did 25 Pecton Frameworks and five of them fractured. Uh, it's a little different. It's a little different. <laughs> these are these are kind of a big deal, you know? And so mm -hmm. I definitely think we have to be careful. And, I, you know, we probably need to do another show. Maybe we see if we can kick uh, Darren, you know, back out of his, uh, back out of his little little lair uh where he's uh, doing his thing and see if we can get him to come on and talk about what he knows yeah so i think we should just stay tuned you know for us to kind of find this out hey have you used pecton mm. have you used uh um you know most of us have used peak right he poly ether ether ketone that's different you know i love these names like, by the way like ether ether ketone ketone I mean, are the chemists running out of names? Can we just like it's not seems call it like that? Because can honestly, we not call it ketone ketone? I when mean, I was re researching this, <laughs> I mean, I'm what like, in the world, man. I mean, I like chemistry, but man, guys. I mean, how many how many Let's K's you gonna it. put in there? How many E's? Like P E E E E K K K K K K. I mean, come on, guys. Just call it ketone. Sorry. You know, peak peak we peak we use. You know, we've yeah. used it for years in dentistry. It's a great material. It's not easy. It's not hard to, to work with, but that's very soft. This is the next level. This is the tops of the tops as far as these polyether <laughs> materials. Let's just say that. But, you know, I, I kind of think it's cool. I think we need to, you know, hey, listen, if you're using it and you've tried it or if you tried it and you, you have good, hey, Send us a picture, man. Yeah. I'd like to see it. We want Tell to me see. your experience. And if, if you're, you're a lab, your... and you know what? Even more, if you're a lab who's yeah. using this and it's just absolutely the best thing you've ever used, we would love to have you on the show. And we would oh, love my. to have you on the show, but not just have you don't, you can't come on the show and just tell us and read a product sheet. We need you to come on the show with cases, with photos, with follow up, with radiographs. Come on, can you bring that? Can you bring that to the table? That'd because be that's awesome. What I'm, you know, we could have Brad, the dental lab guy, on to ask really high level questions because yeah. he knows more than we do about this stuff. Right. So. Let's talk about this because you know what I see, Wes, is I see that it's probably easier on the mill. Oh, oh, am definitely. I? Am I? Am I? I mean, did I say that? Well, you know, it, I mean, why are we really enough? It's because there's a little, maybe not as labor intensive for the I, mill. I mean, and maybe not. As, I'm just saying. I'm just saying, you it's know, possible. I mean, are now, we trying to find works a, out? What if it works out? What are we just saying that, that zirconia is. is too hard to do with? I mean, is that, I mean, is it possible that people are just like, well, zirconia is hard and mm -hmm. I've had some fractures. My ovens right. aren't properly calibrated. Right. Uh, I'm, using a, I'm using a tinker toy mill. Tools. Right. <laughs> and so maybe we're having some problems. So we're looking for the next best thing because we haven't perfected what we did. It's like saying that you know, lava crowns were bad because you didn't know how to properly cool them. You know, well, yep. it wasn't lava crowns. It was your, you didn't know what you're doing. So I don't or, know. I'd love to talk or, to somebody who's doing a lot of this. Or is this something that is being pushed into the, the, the people that are doing their own milling in their own dental office? Like this is mm. a material that they can work with that has less variables, that it's more, it's easier for their mills to mill it. You don't yeah. have to have special ovens. Right. Um, because what I want to do, I don't know about you, but what I want to do is all day long, I no, want to design full arch implant full restorations. Arch. I just want to design crowns all day long. And mill them in my own office. Because that sounds easy. And I mean, it's really, yeah. it's foolproof. Pretty much foolproof. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, uh, you know, let's move on to the next thing here. Yeah, let's do that. And say that this was a great, interview again oh, with uh amy morgan she's inspirational hey, if, wes listen listen if you it really helped me to hear her say certain things about how to interview your uh, maybe for an associateship 
how how a, what a doctor should be preparing for to do an interview, um, mm-hmm. what personality test that was she super prefers, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and why and when to use and, personality tests, when to yeah, not when to care use about it, it. when yeah. to not use it. That that actually helps. Yeah, yeah, and so this was a great interview. Some interesting things about Amy in the beginning of the interview. Yes. You may have already seen some of those things. Right. Maybe as a meme. <laughs> yeah. Maybe some nutcrackers so, involved. Well, I really appreciate um, Amy Morgan. And um, I'm excited about uh, what's going to happen maybe with uh, the combination of Pride Institute and Spear Practice mm-hmm. Solutions. You know, mm-hmm. John and I don't subscribe to Spear Practice uh, Yeah, we're not solutions. using it currently, but we're it's interesting. It. Uh, it's interesting what's going on out there. I think, um, you know, it's uh, something that I think that if, you know, you need to call out there and talk to them about and, and see what they've got going down and maybe they can help you out. So, um, again, we appreciate Amy coming on the show and thanks to all those at Spear Education who made this happen. This is Justin Goodbrand and here is today's tip. Now is the time to work on promoting your business. In January, you want to build your annual marketing plan. If your business is in a growth mode, your marketing budget should be about 10% of your gross revenue. If you're in a stabilization mode, plan on spending between 3 to 5% of your gross revenue. If you are already marketing these levels, it's the perfect time to find out how it's going with a ROI assessment. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak to a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is an investment advisor representative of Heritage Investors, a registered investment advisor. Visit heritageinvestor.com or financiallysimple.com for additional information. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And we are here with a pretty, we're pretty excited about this, Wes, because, mm-hmm. you know, we have gotten to talk once before to Amy Morgan at Spear Summit, and we're really excited to have her on just for an, a really an exclusive show, a real episode, not just kind of an off the cuff show up at Summit and talk. And that was awesome too. But this is really cool because we've had some time to really talk uh, ahead of time about some things we're really excited to ask Amy about. But before we, we kind of talk about who Amy is, I think the first thing I want to ask you about, you were mentioning just as we were kind of getting ready for the show that you're an empty nester now, and that you, but you, but you are not empty <laughs> in your home. You're not completely empty. You had, you mentioned two things that you do have that you hold dear. And, and what, <laughs> what were those two things again? I, people are never going to look at me the same way. Trust me, I'm still an expert in what we're going to be talking about. Um, <laughs> everything that you think about growing older is happening in my life. I, I have cats and nutcrackers. Tis the season <laughs> to have nutcrackers. I, tis I, the season. Tis we, 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 it's just been Christmas time and New Year's is here. Right. And, and you, you mentioned that you just got a new nutcracker, like, and you're super <laughs> excited about it. Tell us about this yeah. new nutcracker. All right. So we were, my husband and I had decided that we were off the nutcrackers for the year. But after a few, <laughs> after I must admit a few drinks, right across oh, yeah, the yeah. street was the Frog King Nutcracker, who actually has a oh. frog in his crown. He's he's a lovely fellow, and and he is now number twenty two. So so nice. yes, twenty two, twenty two, twenty two. Now, what I've seen some nutcrackers <laughs> that are you know large. <laughs> right. And What's I've your seen, largest nutcracker? Yeah. Uh, we have a four foot nutcracker. Oh, oh wow, man! He, he, Whoa, uh, I was <laughs> right, but but uh, but he's 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 kind of like the the nutcracker. He, the the rest just serve him, so the rest oh, are yes. are pretty much normal size. That sounds like the kind of thing where if you were like spending the night at someone's home mm. and you didn't know they had a nutcracker collection, you got up in the middle of the night and you encountered a four foot nutcracker. Probably wouldn't make it to the bathroom. The it would just. <laughs> be there it would just be done right then absolutely you know because honestly they only come out during the holidays so so just so you're say anyone who wants to visit me still can as long as they're not <laughs> allergic to cats right so fair right. enough <laughs> now you said well, that's well, go ahead Wes. Go well ahead. i was just gonna say you know just you've you talked about some of this stuff because you're you're kind of transitioning your life a little bit but and we'll talk a little bit about this later on the show but you Pride is based, tell us where Pride Institute is based, and then you're moving 
um, to where you're splitting your time between two homes now. Tell us a little bit about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Pride Institute, Dr. Pride uh, began the institute, and we've remained uh, at Pride headquarters in Marin County. So we're right in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, you know, and in fact, uh, where the headquarters are, it's kind of interesting, is we've been there for the last 18 years. We're in <clears throat> Hamilton Air Force Base, um, an old Air wow. Force Base that was Whoa. converted. Um, and that's where we've done our leadership training and we'll be continuing for at least half the year in 2019. Um, I live in Sonoma County, which honestly, gentlemen, does not suck. Um, it's, it's a <laughs> lovely place. Um, to, and, uh, and we'll continue because that is where the nutcrackers and the cats are. Uh, but right. uh, absolutely in my exciting new role as uh, vice president of consulting strategy, and a, a faculty member at Spear, I'll be dividing my time. So I'm getting the bachelorette condo. I've uh, been, shopping, oh. been shopping for furniture. Possibly even a Mini Cooper is in my, uh, is oh, in my wow. future. So uh, You're going to be that person. I love it. Footloose That's and awesome. fancy free. Beep, beep. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> have to get awesome. our picture taken with you with your Mini Cooper the next time we're out at Spirit. Yeah, the Nutcracker in the, the passenger nutcracker seat. The Nutcracker in the passenger seat. <laughs> Only for you That's two. It. Only for you yeah. two. Will I break them out without it being a holiday? That's, That's awesome. awesome. And so so let's go back. I know we kind of started that off with just kind of some some fun stuff because I think it's awesome to just hear a little bit about the the other side, the the normal side of your life, quote unquote. But tell us a little bit about kind of how you became who you are in in uh, dental consulting and you know a little bit about your journey in the dental world we'd love to just kind of hear that for listeners that may not know uh, who you are or kind of what you're about with that well long ago in a galaxy far far away it, it seems like a long mm. time ago i i started my journey in dentistry as a medical dental consultant in fact I, what i was specifically handling was cash flow crises uh, because I had the financial planning and the accounting in my background, and I liked dealing with flaming emergencies. And so when I was doing that, it was really fascinating to me because medical was a harder turnaround. You were dealing with hospitals and, and layers of bureaucracy, but dentistry was very unique in the fact that you could see very quick results, even if the the chaos and the crisis was significant. But what I also saw in dentistry was these crises were started by dentists who just didn't understand their business. And it was a, a minor mistake that would <clears throat> escalate to a, a major, major stress, be it bankruptcy, be it embezzlement, be it tax issues. And so at that point, as I would ride off into the sunset, having handled the crisis, I was looking to see how I could train the dentists and their teams to avoid that in the future because they were no further trained. You know? And so that's when I started to look at alternatives. And, and I've shared this story several times. Um, I found a course called Dentist is Entrepreneur, which was the first Pride course I was ever exposed to. And Dr. Pride actually had it co-taught by a dentist and an accountant. And the, the dentist had to suffer through breaking out a profit and loss statement, understanding their expenses. And I mean, that was, you had me at hello. And right <laughs> around the fifth or sixth time I attended with a client, Dr. Pride rightfully asked me why I waited until they were in crisis and invited mm. me to join Pride. And that was around the beginning of, or actually towards the end of 1992, in 98, I became the CEO of Pride. And in 2004, when Dr. Pride passed away, I, I, I took over the honor and the legacy of, of being the owner. And, you know, mm -hmm. and bringing it all the way to present, um, you know, Frank and, you know, Frank Spear and Dr. Pride were very close and had, had looked at models to combine management and ideal clinical care. And, and I know he and his family and his family are alive and unbelievably thrilled to death that we were able to fulfill Dr. Pride's legacy by by combining and now being part of fabulous Spear Education. Hmm. And awesome. that is a pretty awesome story to take us, like you say, all the way till now. And, you know, when we were <clears throat> at Summit, you shared a little bit about 
philosophy and some things that you felt were uh, important in terms of leadership. And, you know, but I think that, you know, it's so interesting to see how Spear, which we've been, you know, involved with for a long time, um, and, and Pride have kind of joined together because I, and this first question I want to ask you really goes right into that. You know, when you see uh, a successful dental practice, you know, and, and you could define that, I know lots of ways, a lot of that depends on, on what the, the owner of the practice wants to see success. But I guess I would say successful from a, maybe from a business uh, standpoint, um, what do you think contributes more to the success? Do you think it's the clinical skills or do you think it's the communication and leadership skills of, of the doctors? Well, it's it's interesting that you say that. Is It also depends on who is actually filtering that success. Unfortunately, to the patient or to patients-to-be, they're not necessarily going to perceive a dental office as successful because of marginal integrity, right? Mm. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 yet, you know, and that's... You know, the definition of marketing is being well known and well thought of. And I've 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 never heard a referral or a testimonial, you know, say I go to this dental office because the margins are sweet. They say I go to this dental office because I love them. They make me mm. feel uh, you know, part of a family. They listen to me and of course I have a beautiful smile. Now, you know, we all know that there are places out there in disreputable dental practices that do cineplex dentistry. You can basically watch, you know, 3D movies, um, and that could be perceived as a beautiful smile too. And so absolutely a core from an ethical point of view and a values point of view and an integrity point of view is the doctor and team believing in their clinical care and choices. So that's a step zero of success. But the package of the business being successful is the vision, the culture, and the relationships that they have with their internal customers, their team, and their external customers, their patients to patient and patients to be. Mm. Okay. So, so it sounds like clinical is sort of a building block but in the end, it's 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 only a it's only a building block. Right. Right. It starts not, at step zero, which is good yeah. clinical skills. So, can a doctor with poor clinical skills be successful in dental practice? Unfortunately, yes. I, I yes. I mean, that there's snake oil salesmen in any profession, right? And mm. and you know when particularly in today's society where word of mouth is world of mouth via online communication and the internet, um, you know, um, the fact of the matter is, is that dentistry as a whole, as a brand, as a heroic brand, does have to compete with, um, you know, those who promise a brilliant dentition in an hour, right? Or, you Mm -hmm. know, um, and uh, the model, the business plan to a corporate analyst is very, very workable. Um, and, uh, but do they sleep at night? Um, and, you know, and, uh, so, you know, the good news is, is, you know, as long as the individual provider or providers who, who do do the hard work and the heavy lifting of being clinically excellent and a perpetual student to continue to be better and better, they still can attract a patient profile that won't be wooed by the glitter and the you know glamour of mm-hmm. teeth in a minute. You know? So it, it is yeah. conceivable, but there's no denying it. Um, there are many who fake it and still perceive to make it. Right, right. And, I, and we talk about this a lot with younger dentists who, I mean, one of the most common questions we get from newer dentists is, you know, I, I, I'm in a lot of debt. I don't, because we talk about continuing education all the time. I mean, it's, it's a big part of the, of our show and our, our passion, but, uh, they'll often ask the question, you know, I have limited funds. I have debt. Where should I spend my money? Should, you know, because they're, they're told constantly, I think they hear more, honestly, uh, marketing wise, uh, many times from, from the business side of training, you know, they say, well, go to, go to this place, learn about business, learn about leadership, learn about communication. And then there's kind of another camp of, you know, go learn clinical skills and that take that pathway. 
And obviously it's not that these are not mutually exclusive. Right. We, you can do both. But how do you advise a young doctor as to what type of pathway they should take uh, with continuing their education after school as far as how do we integrate learning the clinical skills as well as you know balancing that with business? Where, where should they spend their money? Well, it's interesting because I'm going to answer it in two different ways, right? Uh, first of all, the definition of an entrepreneur is one who takes risks for expected rewards. And if you've got a young clinician who's viewing their financial resources through a scarcity, they're not embodying you know, the true essence of entrepreneurial behavior. If I'm going to invest in deeper clinical learning, I am going to demand the reward, but I'm going to make the investment, right? And I may, you know, and it might hurt a little bit. Uh, you know, the Warren Buffett you know, uh, you know, mythology of, you know, there was a lot of lean years before all of a sudden exponentially he became a cabillionaire, right? So, so there, you know, the dental, the dental world has more resources than most. Um, and your job is to use the resources wisely. That's number one. Number two, I mentioned this earlier, my definition of marketing is the art and science of being well-known and well thought of. And the well known <laughs> is you could have a billboard with, you know, scratch and sniff teeth with Miss America parading across it. That might make you well known, but that doesn't make you well thought of. It's the heroic brand that promised to your community that you actually deliver on that creates the well thought of. It's different than the advertising slogan. You, you remember, well, since it's just past the holidays, remember the movie Elf, World's Best Cup of Coffee, that, you know, where he goes in and he congratulates everybody? That's advertising at its worst form. That's not marketing because in marketing, if you say you're delivering the world's best cup of coffee, it better be the world's best cup of coffee, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. a clinician that doesn't have the confidence, let's say you are marketing and you're getting a boatload of people in, a clinician that doesn't have the confidence to look at each individual and with confidence say, this is exactly what you need and this is the result we're going for, um, is not going to fulfill the promise that that original marketing did for them anyway. So it is honestly so intertwined. One mm -hmm. can't live without the other. You got to do both. <clears throat> You know, I think one of the things that <clears throat> we heard when we came out of school, or actually I heard, and I know John did as well, was that we need to, as a dentist, your craft is being with a patient, doing a mechanical, clinical, very hands-on type of thing. And that takes repetition to learn that. But the the business side of that gets pushed to the five o'clock work hour or the seven o'clock or six o'clock in the morning before you see patients and either you're, you, you dread it or you love it. Okay. And so one of the things that we were advised about was that we need to surround ourselves from the very beginning with an accountant, um, a business advisor, maybe that's a financial planner, maybe a business coach even. And I think a lot has been made of having maybe a dental specific um, type coach and type uh, advisor, even a dental accountant um, that is specific. And, and we, dentistry is special. Speak to why that's good advice in the beginning because your clinical skills, I feel like, you come out just barely, even today. You know, Kevin Quishan said on our show that, you know, the educational system in dentistry is broken and there needs to be looked at. But it takes, like Dennis Tarnow said, 10 years to change education. So, yes, we can get educated because there's great places like Spear and great many places like that to learn good clinical skills. But also now we have the ability to, to hire people. And why should we do that right when we get out of school? Should we, what, what, does, that, what does that mean? For well, you? you absolutely should, and I'll explain why. But I'm also going to say that you have to delegate, not abdicate, because you have to choose your experts wisely. And it's not just a pedigree that I work with dentists, right? 
Um, you have to find your, you have to line up your experts that match your vision and values and strategies, right? Mm. Uh, I've known many a young provider who have, who have, you know, my best friend said that he or she was good, ergo, you, you know, that works. So, so a, a, a responsibility and one of the things that, that I bring to Spear Education is that you have to educate the young provider, the median provider, and the transitioning, the older senior provider, enough to be able to ask the right questions of their experts. You know, you, you have to, otherwise you can't monitor or manage because abdication means that you're no longer in control of your business and that will never work. Mm -hmm. But with mm -hmm. that said, to go back to your original point, uh, the reason that that experts, accountants, financial planners, definitely I, I consider that dental coaches are essential because why wait till 10 years later when you're under a pile of very bad business habits, right? It's a lot easier to fix up front than it is to fix later on once those habits are cemented, uh, is that that dentistry is unique. Let's just even look at the bigger picture of small business. You know, for every hundred small businesses that open in any given year, 80 of them are out of business in that same year. Hmm. Those stats don't hold up to dentistry at all because dentistry is a wanted and needed service that's um, for many, always. So for every four that say no, the fifth will say yes. So it runs different. Right, it runs different than big <clears throat> business. It runs uh, different than eighty percent of the small businesses out there. And to give you an example of even marketing, right? Obviously, you get so, you know you you have a friend who's a great website designer who's done websites for all of these great retail stores. We all know a retail message does not equate to a dental uh, familial partnering co-diagnostic <clears throat> experience and so so you might get the best that that expert has but it doesn't speak to dentistry or the dental patient the same thing with accounting um you know a, a different staff configuration different forecasted days different expectations of 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 the budgets that you need to set to keep your technology current to keep your your uh your service mix current so it, it's just very, very unique. And, and you know, to, to even give you another point, a outside of the industry marketing, uh, you know, professional might, you know, hire a busload of tourists to come visit your office for a new patient experience, but those tourists are not the patient that you're looking for. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So right. So it's unique enough that it deserves somebody who understands the cadence, the flow, the results uh, and the values that great dentistry can provide. Hmm. Well, I, I think that you know that that leads right, I think, into the the next question is, you know, because we have to understand uh, who we're hiring, you know, and we need to understand um, what they're what they're bringing to the table. You know, I want to maybe zoom in a little bit more on on how that deals with personality. You know, we talked a little bit about that at Spear Summit with you about you know, personality and leadership and, and how that plays. Um, I, you know, I just wonder what you think of personality assessments. You know, do you think that they're useful? Do you think, uh, which, and if so, which do you, which do you like, which do you use and, and how useful really are they? I mean, you've, you've borne this out over a lot of years because you'll hear people say, you know, well, I, I test my employees or, you know, I test prospective hires. Um, and, and they feel that that's important, but I think it really takes a lot of years to see that and to know if that really actually works. And, and I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I'm going to say yes. And, and it's funny because I actually just did this with an office that I'll change the name to protect the guilty. So, uh, uh, when, when you look at personality styles, learning styles, communication styles, when you're talking about a culture, it means everything. Right? It means everything, but because it's the experience, <clears throat> right? The experience uh, that you're trying to create. When you're talking about hiring someone, for me, it means a great deal less. Because what do I mean by it means everything for the culture and less about hiring? One of the things that's very hard to realize is that anyone who who studies 
personality profiles will tell you diversity is the key. There isn't mm. a right profile, right? Mm. Though sometimes we think our own pri- profile is the right profile. Of course. I certainly yeah. do, right? Well, I know mine yeah, is. I do, yeah. yeah so. Mine is the best, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, uh, at the same time, <laughs> Uh, I am a uh, certified DISC provider. I've certainly done Myers-Briggs uh, and all the other stuff. DISC I use because it's much simpler. Um, mm. you know, but the whole concept of DISC, D, driver, I, influencer, S, steady, C, cautious, is that there are strengths and challenges within every personality profile that together creates synergy, right? You mm. know, um, r- the dominant dominant personality style in disc that 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 dentistry falls to and when i say dominant 70 to 80 percent is some combination of s and c steady and cautious Mm. and if you have an office full of s's and c's then you're going to miss the beauty of the driver and the influencer (laughs) i just recently uh you know every now and then i still take on some 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 special clients and, and when i say special i mean special and uh i recently did later on because uh it's a big group multiple locations they're creating an infrastructure of management leadership and they were bucking up against each other and there was some clashing going on and uh we used the disc profile um as a way for them to celebrate the differences not eradicate the differences we asked questions Good. like, what, what do most of your coworkers most understand about your profile? How do you want to be communicated to in conflict? Because it mm. is needed. And I will tell you, the, the, um, the, the owner, operator, is an ID, and he's hired a team leader that is a higher D than he is. And his I comes first, the influencer, and they're struggling. Right, they are struggling. So it is a factor, but I would never want to make it judgment. I would I mean, I am sure that there are cautious office managers that can learn to be influencers and drivers as well. So I am not a fan of all as using it for hiring. I am a fan for for collegial harmony and understanding of each other. Mm. Uh mm-hmm. makes total sense to me. So how do you <clears throat> If you if you are looking at hiring a team member, whether it's an associate or whether it's front office office manager, you've you've let's say you've interviewed them from a standpoint of to the point to where you're ready to do this test. Do you do the test do before you hire them? I wouldn't. Mm-hmm. You I wouldn't. wouldn't. Uh, because I'm I here's the deal. Do I love behavioral questions? Yes, I do. When people mm-hmm. interview, first of all, uh, we all know that there are classes on how to write a resume, how to answer questions. We, you know, uh, you know it's, not, right. it's not unusual to, to take a test, and I hate the word test, assessment's a better way, because test takes it to right. you're being judged already. Um, there are people who will answer that assessment during the hiring process as to what they think the office wants to see. It, it very right. rarely reveals the true, you know, the true, uh, you know, strengths and challenges of the individual. So behavioral questions like, you know, how would your best friend describe you? You know, what mm. do you look for in other? I mean, you can ask questions that if you understand enough about is there somebody who waits for direction? Is there someone right. who looks for detail? You can you can analyze to the characteristics. I don't think that the assessment helps at all. So one of the things that we, we've done is years ago I bought into, um, there was a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Patrick Wall, and he had, and you may have recognized the name, he and his office manager did things. They had um, Office Magic was the name of the book that they wrote, and actually... I had this lane on my uh, Office Magic uh, Magic's most killer interview questions of all time because we're interviewing for a reception position, and we have highlighted my office manager did, you know, what we were going to ask this upcoming interview. And some of the questions here are exactly how you described it. It is looking for a behavioral response on right off the cuff, and it really does bring out 
I mean, 95 to 99 percent of the time, they don't make it past this interview and they all come out of it sweating. The people that shine are the people that you want to hire. Uh, it's rare that people make it past this interview that we, you know, we would hire that um, that we wouldn't hire. And so let me ask you this. There, there's a question in here um, and it talks about um, the most. In, this is the most important interview question of all time. And he says that the question is, can you please describe your most significant accomplishment? And Dr. Wall says the question has been called the most important interview question of all time because without it, you run the risk of judging a candidate on her interviewing skills rather than her job competency. The answers are always more important than the questions. Remember this one question and you'll have most of the information you need to make a decision. Do you agree with that? I would add two more questions. What is the most significant job achievement and why was it significant for you and others? Did you me? read this? Because his oh. next question is, what are your most outstanding skills? <laughs> no, no, but, but <laughs> great then, minds think then, alike. It, yes. Does it go to challenge? Because yes. my mm. favorite, I think it shows maturity and, and vulnerability and, frankly, emotional intelligence for a candidate for a position to talk about their raging failures mm, uh, mm. as well as their most significant <clears throat> successes, right? Uh, that be, you know, um, and it's not easy, right? I mean, and, right. and the raging failure questions very often show you whether you've got a continuous learner, uh, mm -hmm. someone someone who's, who's uh, you know, doesn't have we, have, we have an acronym at Pride, um, it's a, it, it's a fancy, stupid acronym. It's a Greek disease called IJETA. I'm doing just mm. about everything that you're talking about, right? Which means I don't, I'm shut down to everything um, and I never learn again. So, so mixing it up and going to the challenge, the dark side, uh, mm. can, can be as impactful uh, as as going to the success side because they're here to show you you know I can tap dance look at me right, right. Um, when when you get into man I have the same problem or yeah this is you know the, you know and how would you handle it uh, to me the mark of an excellent potential team member is I'm gonna need help this is areas yeah. I want to know there more you go. right yeah that's good yeah, somebody's totally eager true. yeah. Yeah. yeah, eager to learn. Yeah. So, so when we come, so as we're kind of in this this thought process now about about hiring, just kind of the way that that is is rolled and talking about personality. You know, one of the things that uh, um, we we've we've gotten there's a whole different ball game when you talk about hiring a doctor uh, versus hiring uh, you know a, a team member or an assistant. Um, they're all important, super important, but um, that associateship position you know we we have a lot of questions from both sides of that uh, that come to us sometimes about uh, you know the senior doctor wants to know um, you know what questions do you think are important to uh, ask an associate uh, but I, I kind of want to maybe talk about it from the other side of the equation if you are the potential associate if you're advising you know a doctor who wants an associateship position um, what do you tell them to do to prepare for that interview uh, and, and how do they make themselves a better candidate for that position that they're looking for? That's a great question. And I'm going to answer a senior question right before I go there. The senior doctors shouldn't make a differential between other team members. You hire for attitude, you train for ability. So the, say, you know, so, you know, uh, the, the worst mistake you could make is to actually not ask the human questions not ask mm -hmm. the relationship question, not to expect to mentor and grow or to expect that you're hiring an associate strictly for their clinical skills and not how they relate to the team, how they um, participate in the systems, how they want to market themselves, how they're going to connect to the patients. So my viewpoint for the senior doctor <clears throat> is business as usual uh, make this three-dimensional. Don't say you're an associate. I hired you. Go do your thing, and I'm never gonna coach or you know coach you again. For the associate to be, the most kind thing I can say is now I'm gonna go opposite to it. 
is I don't want you to think of it it's just like your, your job interview for McDonald's when you had your first job in, um, in high school. You're a professional. This is a partnership. And you got to come in not just looking at what are they going to pay me is, is there a similar vision, values, and philosophy? Um, how, how does the doctor treat his or her team? Uh, what do they appreciate most about their patient base? Because, um, it, because it's, it's hard for the young professional to perceive themselves as a professional. Um, mm. You're coming in as an equal, um, and you're coming in as a fellow colleague uh, who hopefully is going to connect energy to a, it's something that they can believe in and help grow and improve, right? So it is okay to say, how am I, you know, how will new patients be, um, be assigned? Uh, what kind of dentistry do you enjoy doing most? What do you expect me to do? Because no one wants an associate to have the ice water dip of being ready to do full mouth different types of dentistry and discover that all they're doing is buckle pit amalgams, right? Right. Mm. So, so uh, being okay to 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 look for the love connection on both sides uh, is an essential element of finding a home because there's nothing worse than giving sweat equity to a. Uh, a practice that doesn't enhance your clinical skill set or set you up for your future. Yeah. If do you think right. that there's do you think that there's a problem with uh, mentorship in associateship positions uh, these days? Oh, I think that's always been a problem uh, yeah. in mentorship. Uh, and then what happens is the associate gets institutionalized because you know no information means I develop my own habits. You know, it, it's very mm. similar to when, you know, I, I used to teach uh, practice management in nine different dental schools. And one of the things we did was, is we would tie, we would tie the theory to what was actually happening on the clinic floor. We would actually get permission from the universities to actually have the students do some of the things we were talking about, because there's nothing worse then all of a sudden having a team and, you know, in dental school, you're like, I know somebody's doing sterilization, but I really have never met them. I don't right. get to work with auxiliaries that much. Certainly they get scheduled somehow, and I don't know this. And so the more you're exposing the associate to the business side, the leadership side, and the clinical side, the more they're growing and learning and preparing for their next level, right? And, and yeah, and, that's and, important. and it seems like you're right that it's always been a problem. Do you feel that there is a generational difference with that? Or do you feel like that is kind of the same challenges that have always been faced? You know, we, there's, we always get this, this question about, you know, is there a, a difference now between, you know, the generations and how they view mentorship bo on both sides, on both sides, uh, or is or is it really just the same problem that we've had? Or does the competitive nature of dentistry, has, has that created the problem? Uh, or is it uh, really a difference between generations? Well, it, it's, uh, I always hate to pull the generation card, especially since I want to be cool with the millennials versus a baby boomer. But um, the bottom line is, is that today's graduate is graduating with more debt and possibly has at least been exposed to new clinical innovations where the senior doctor has not adapted or used, you know, the, as they come mm -hmm. in and they're still using, you know, paper up the wazoo and, and, you know, um, when my day we did it this way. So there, there, there does need to be an acknowledgement um, on both sides that you can learn from each other. Right. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, um, I have a prosthodontist in um, Princeton who's just taken on a, another prosthodontist as an associate. And uh, he's actually the vice president of the American College of Pros. And, and he was just saying to me on the phone, this is what I'm teaching him and this is what he's teaching me. And, and that works really well. Um, you know, so there, you know, so uh, there is a mutual that goes back to recognizing each other as colleagues. You know, mm -hmm. the best coaches in any situation uh, learn something from their coachee as much as the coachee's mm. learning from. I mean, you learn, adapt, and grow. So, uh, no. And, and the methods, how to communicate, um, 
yeah, that's shifted a little bit. So I, my, my fondest advice to the senior doctor is stop pushing paper, mm. right? Uh, uh, you know, speed it up, uh, you know, communicate in a way that actually resonates. We learn to do that with our patients. Why wouldn't we learn to do that with our team? So, so that's good advice. yeah. So let's kind of, kind of conclude this up because right after we were at the summit, we got this email kind of announcing that Spear had acquired Pride Institute, right? Yes. Yes. And? That is exciting news. And why did Spear and Pride decide that they just needed to, to get together? Well, it's, it, you know, it was serendipitous and in the works for a really long time. When you look at the six degrees of separation, uh, you know, the years that Frank and, uh, and Jim worked together, the years at Panky, the years with Dawson, the years that Gary and I co-taught the new patient experience course as a Pride Panky course, we're all, inter, we're all interwoven. <coughs> and, and in the past, clinical kept to their silo and practice management kept to their silo. And, mm -hmm. and it didn't, you know, and sometimes there'd be a little bit of, of, of um, territorial over, you know, over which dollar gets spent where, uh, wh what you were right. talking mm -hmm. about earlier, right? Uh, you know, in, in all of my years in conversations with Frank or with Gary or MTAs, uh, you know, we've always said one can't exist without the other. And, you know, mm. there's nothing better when we were talking about interviewing experts than having your advice all come from a trusted source that brings on the best. And, mm. you know, frankly, I was not in any, um, in any mood to transition. I'm young. I've got cats and, and nutcrackers. I'm going nutcrackers. nowhere. Right. And right. so, so when, when I got a phone call from Gary and MTA saying, Hey, we have this brilliant dashboard analytics platform. Uh, we're, we're now in 18 months and just want to get the best coaching, the best content to add to what we've got. Would you mind helping us? A little bell went off in my head and, uh, you know, because, um, I, I have been approached by many on the sale of Pride Institute. I have only said yes to one. And the reason, mm. that, because it is, uh, you, want, you want to value the company that you're joining. And there is no question that there is nothing better as far as Sphere Clinical Education and what they've already created with Sphere Practice Solutions is pretty darn sassy as well. And mm -hmm. uh, the fact that we're joining is very powerful. And it's the first, the first joining like this in our dental community. And it's going to make life a lot simpler for our dental community because we're going to add the marketing specialists, the financial specialists, the transition specialists, so that there is a you know, uh, a it's almost like the good housekeeping seal of approval. If this mm -hmm. is a spear endorsed expert, you still have to make sure that the the advice matches your needs because there are many, many consultants out there and financial planners out there that I have worked and collaborated with um, that are wonderful. But there is something to be said about these experts have been vetted. And this is mm -hmm. the finest <clears throat> information in council, and it all interweaves versus Knox heads. And that's, and that's how it happened. And right now, we're bringing with us not only our pride content, but our, our, our key pride team members are moving along with us. Our, our consultants, our doctors, they're you know, top of their game. We're also bringing our pride community who has very often studied at Spear, but we have a formidable mm -hmm. community that do serve as mentors, um, and they'll be um, joining the Spear community at the Spear summits, at all the events, and, and it's going to be powerful. And I'm, I couldn't be more satisfied with the fact that although it was a little bit premature, 
it was the right move. Well, <clears throat> this is what we're excited about because you mentioned yeah. some things too, even that Panky has done in the past, that new patient experience type thing, the the touchy-feely stuff that makes people appreciate a unique practice. And I feel like that, you know, Spear teaches not necessarily unique dentistry, but, you know, it's it's unique and essential that we're doing, hey, we're, that's the pursuit of great dentistry. And this sounds like just a, an amazing fit. We kind of thought that something was going on. John and I talked about that. Right, right. But, but we couldn't, but we, we, it did... I was like, wow, this is happening now. And so we're excited. Congratulations. Thank you. And yeah. Um, yeah, awesome. we're excited to see what happens um, with just the whole aura of Spear and and what's going to change uh, in the future. It sounds like change for the for really a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're excited till, to, to see what, what happens. Just wait, gentlemen. If there's nutcrackers in the classroom, yeah, we'll know Amy's been there. Exactly. Yes, yeah. we will know now. So when we walk into Spear Education next time and we walk across the front desk, right. yeah. there's, there's, a, there's a thing of nuts and a cracker right there. Yeah. Let's get this day started right. Yeah. <laughs> you got to leave your stamp. You got to leave your stamp on the place, I, Amy. I like that. I envision That's that awesome. when you go to the restroom, if one's sitting by the 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 sink, you're going to know that A, yes. we've taken it to yes. the worst possible cl- conclusion. We won't make awesome. that happen, I promise. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> and on that bombshell, <laughs> we'll- <Yes. laughs> Oh, it's been really fun, Amy, to get to hang out and just Thank to hear you. a little bit more about your passion for the dental profession and, and, you know, to, to kind of hear that, you know, obviously we've talked about some real nuts and bolts kind of things today, yeah. but we've also just talked a lot about, you know, philosophy and what, um, we're, we really are excited. I think that, as you said, um, this is, it's funny that it's taken so long for this kind of uh, collaboration to happen. Mm. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a time where, where we really need that. Yep. And a lot of our colleagues that uh, we know are, are listening to our show because of the clinical side of things, which is what we spend a lot of time on. Uh, this is, this is really what they, they need more of and we, mm-hmm. and we need more of. And so we appreciate that. Um, we definitely, uh, we think that if you're listening to the show now and you are uh, connecting with what uh, Amy's talking about or what we're talking about. We want to hear from you. We want us want you to leave us some feedback. Uh, tell us what you think about uh, connecting uh, practice management, business, finance, and clinical dentistry. Is that, a, is that a good idea? You know, tell us what you think about that and leave us, leave us some feedback. And if you're interested in learning more about uh, what Amy's doing, you know, I, I think probably the best place to do that is just to start at Spear Education. And of course, you can also check out Pride as well. Uh, but we think uh, this is this is going to be, you know, Practice Solutions is really where this is going to live. And so uh, if you want to learn more about that, you know, Spear's got a lot of information about Spear Practice Solutions uh, on their website and would be happy to talk to you about it. Or check them out when you're out at uh, seminars and workshops. I know you guys are doing a lot with that, just introducing people to kind of that ecosystem uh, when they're out there. Uh, definitely make sure you give us a, a positive review on uh, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, all those wonderful social media platforms. Remember, we are now on Instagram. We have finally gotten younger, and uh, we, we made it there. So uh, we appreciate all the people out at Spear as well helping to put this interview together today, all the behind-the-scenes. Garrett, Carson, uh, really much appreciated. Amy, thank you so much for being thank with you, us Amy. today. See you, guys. Appreciate See it. See you later. Bye. See ya. Bye.